General Petraeus, uh, 37 years a soldier, um, 10 years at the KKR Institute, which I'm just about to ask you about, now an author. Welcome to Doha. Great to be back, and frankly, it's great to be back in a very different time from when I was the commander of U.S. Central Command. As many of you will know, the forward headquarters of CENTCOM is out at Al Udeed Air Base, not far outside Doha. When I was privileged to be the commander, we had 250,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, two and a half wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and the pirates off Somalia. And now peace has broken out, uh, and it's great to be back. I was, we were discussing off-site, and I, my reckoning is that you were the first person to have that many people since Alexander the Great arrived here. <laughs> I don't know about time. that, but, is it, but it is good to be back. And it, no, it's nice to see the rapprochement, frankly, between the Gulf states, between certain Gulf states and Israel, uh, ceasefire in Yemen, discussions across the Gulf with Iran and so forth. Um, touch wood that this all turns out well. Do you think, just let's start on that, we'll come back to the, to the actually, let's start on risk. You, you, you've done the KKR Institute for 10 years now. Yep. What, what, how has risk changed? Well, it's changed dramatically. I think we've seen seismic, uh, profound change. When I joined KKR a decade ago after being the director of the CIA, the world was described, I think, as benign globalization. Yeah. The barriers to the flow of capital, investment, trade, economics in general were all gradually being reduced. Global trade was going up at an angle like that. Ten years later, we're in an era of renewed great power rivalries. The barriers to trade, investment, capital flows are all going up, uh, and globalization has become slobalization. Uh, there's still a gradual increase in global trade in aggregate, although a lot of it is regional now rather than truly global. So it's quite a profound change. Do you, see, do you see China as the biggest risk now? Well, it's, I think the, the continued rise of China and then the friction that has evolved between the U.S. and China, the West and China, frankly, uh, is the single biggest issue that has led to, uh, to this. But certainly the resurgence of Russia, the brutal invasion of Ukraine, uh, all of these are factors that have, again, returned us to an era of great power rivalries. So one, one more thing on China. Do you think, when you look at China, do you, and you talk to a lot of companies about this, do you now see a decoupling with China as inevitable? No, not at all. In fact, we think decoupling is not possible. Uh, in fact, last year, uh, the U.S. and China had the, the greatest trade that they've ever had. Uh, China is the number three trading partner for the U.S. behind our to continental, uh, yeah. same, you know, U.S., MC, Mexico, Canada trade agreement partners, uh, again, of Canada and Mexico, uh, and we're the largest trading partner for China. So again, decoupling is not, not feasible. Um, selective decoupling is taking place, however. Uh, De-risking, I think, is yeah. how the, the EU head terms it and so forth. And so certainly there are various issues, there are various sectors, there are these that involve dual use, military as well as civilian, uh, certain high technology areas. We think that there will probably be an outbound investment regime established in the United States. I mean, this is what the KKR Global Institute focuses on perhaps more than anything else, is trying to understand where is the relationship between the West and China going, because Again, geopolitical risk, when I first joined KKR and established the Global Institute, this is what we did when we invested in the former Yugoslavia for yeah. the first time, or Africa, or even Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Philippines, various other Southeast Asian countries. It wasn't what we did in the major economies of the Pacific or Europe or what have you. Now it is everywhere, uh, and there are implications for what's going on for almost every investment that takes place. They all touch in some way uh, either some China relationship uh, or also the implications of the Russian war on Ukraine. We'll come to Russia in just a second. But on, on China, in the end, surely the biggest risk is Taiwan. Do you, what kind of probability do you put on the Chinese? I think it is still unlikely. Um, we get a vote, if you will, we, the, the West, collectively, the U.S. Uh, deterrence is what we are seeking, uh, and deterrence is founded on two elements, uh, a potential adversary's assessment of your capabilities on the one hand and your willingness to employ them on the other. 
It's incumbent on us and of our allies and partners together uh, to make sure that we are transforming our capabilities, hardening, improving resilience, all the rest of this in the Indo-Pacific region, as it is now termed, and then also making sure there aren't doubts about our willingness to employ the capabilities we have without trying to be provocative. There's no, no desire to mm. provoke something. The desire is to prevent it, to deter it, to dissuade it. And I think, again, that in general, that is working. Back to the big one at the moment, Ukraine. Sitting, I think, in this chair yesterday, Victor Orban's told me, um, when I challenged him about Hungary's relative reticence in helping, um, or helping Ukraine, he just said simply, Ukraine can't win. Do you agree with that? I think he's entirely on the wrong side of what will be history in that regard. Uh, I think that Ukraine is going to show what can happen when you have well-trained, well-equipped, now with Western equipment, uh, substantial uh, additional forces that are well-led, uh, taking on forces that have now been beaten up over 15 months of combat. They've been in the line continuously, the Russians. They, they have taken enormous losses, many, many times the losses in the first 15 months of this war that they took an entire decade in Afghanistan, many times. Uh, they have individual replacements. That's not the way you have cohesive units. They're not well-trained. They're not well-equipped. They're not well-led. In fact, the command climate is abusive. And they're about to execute the most challenging of all missions, which is to withdraw under, in contact with the enemy because they're defending forward of their defensive lines. And they're not going to do well. In fact, I think they will crumble. In some cases, they will collapse. The question is how broadly uh, is that crumbling and collapse. Keep in mind that last year, when the Ukrainians succeeded so impressively in the offensive south of Kharkiv in the east, at a certain point they ran out, they culminated, they basically, physically you run out at about the 72, 96 hour, we proved this during the invasion of Iraq when I was mm -hmm. a two star, uh, there's just a limit to how far you can go. And then you need follow-on forces to continue. They really didn't have the follow-on forces. This time, they have it all. And they're going to achieve combined arms effects for the first time in the war. So you have Western tanks, Western infantry fighting vehicles, infantry keeping the anti-tank guided missiles off the tanks, artillery and mortars suppressing them, uh, electronic warfare jamming the Russian command and control system, air defense keeping that out of action, drones out helping you target in depth, and logistics right up behind them with additional food, fuel, uh, ammunition, and medical assistance, and then most importantly, follow on forces. So when the lead elements culminate, as naturally they will at a certain point, you just push through the follow on, and then you do it again. They have uh, at least six new armored brigades. These are each 3,500, and then many other additional brigades uh, with additional combat support and combat service support elements. And I think they're going to do much better than people realize. Keep in mind that the Russians have lost across the board since the beginning, with the exception of the modest gains that they made in the south. They lost the Battle of Kiev, the Battle of Kharkiv, the Battles of Sumy, Chernihiv, Kherson, and now they have failed to achieve their winter offensive op uh, objectives as well. They did finally take Bakhmut after enormous losses, just staggering colossal losses with essentially human wave attacks. And basically what they've done is they have seized a city that they have destroyed. Um, and you're going to see, I think, the the uh, Ukrainians conduct very impressive combined arms operations. And so this is not at all a case that they cannot win. Now, I'm not saying they're going to take all of it back this year, much less Crimea, um, but I think it can put them in a position where all of a sudden, finally, I hope, Vladimir Putin realizes that Russia is not going to outsuffer the Ukrainians, the Europeans, and the Americans. That's really the key here. What do, you, uh, what, do you, what do you see as Putin's strategy? What do you think he is trying? To, is he trying to wait, perhaps, to a more clement American sure, president? Yeah. Is he trying to? Well, I, I think he's just trying to survive there and then hope that something happens where the West finally tires of this and the Europeans and the Americans 
you know, it's time to negotiate or something like that. By the way, I think that we would be very wrong to do that, uh, not only because this is, is about as clear a case of right versus wrong as I think we've seen in our lifetime, but also because the Ukrainians are going to fight on. The Ukrainians are determined to retake their country, uh, and they are not going to be dissuaded uh, again. So, but the question is, can you get Russia to that point? Mm. Keep in mind, this is not just about the losses on the battlefield. It's also about the damage to their economy. Yes, the sanctions have not brought them to their knees, but it has probably set their economy back a decade at least already. And a lot of the damage is downstream, literally downstream, because it's the major oil companies not ca carrying out the additional exploration and production in very difficult areas. And that will all accumulate over time. It'll take time. But again, we need to tighten those sanctions and we need to continue our support for Ukraine. And uh, I think in, in general uh, that the US-led coalition, the Western world here, has done a very impressive job uh, of supporting Ukraine. $36 billion of just security assistance from the US alone is staggering. Do you worry about the consequences, just to sort of think through, is imagine Ukraine does win and imagine there is a point where maybe Vladimir Putin hangs on. You know, some people talk about the fact they don't want the Donbass to become the new border with a slightly dysfunctional Russia, or perhaps even really the effective border with China. China, Russia becomes a client state of, of China in that respect. I think that the China-Russia relationship is, it is certainly not a partnership without limits, as yeah. it was declared. We've seen very distinct limits. I really don't think that China, President Xi, doesn't see Russia as an equal when uh, President Xi went uh, to Moscow, had his summit with, with Putin. He didn't get what he wanted. China, this is a very transactional relationship at heart. It's not a relationship between two equals. There's a very nice, in the uh, current economist, there's a, it's a hyper rival um, with which I was once associated. They have a very nice line from Henry Kissinger where he said that he's never met a senior Russian who had good things to say about the Chinese or a senior and vice Chinese. Versa. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, let me just add, by the way, that I thought it was striking that, that Kissinger also uh, noted that it's now actually important that Ukraine become a member of NATO. And I agree wholeheartedly with him. I felt it was important for that they should have been. A, we never should have dangled it out there and then sort of yeah. brought it back. If you make that offer, you need to follow through. But his point is exactly right. We have now armed Ukraine to the teeth. The border of European security now doesn't end at NATO's border at this point in time. It really actually ends at Ukraine's border. Do you think, do you think Europe has changed during this? I, the yes, other day I, do. I was I was in yep. Madrid. If you go to Madrid, yep. if you go to the yes. west of Europe, yep. the it's front, changed front dramatically. The frontier of Europe has sure. moved to the east. Yeah, it's changed dramatically. I was at the Munich Security Conference a few days before the invasion, you already felt more NATO unity than I'd felt since I was a major writing speeches for the Supreme Allied Commander at Europe. It's quite profound. Certainly that has moved to the Eastern Europe, but all of Europe. And NATO, you know, Putin set out to make Russia great again. What he's really done is make NATO great again. Uh, you already have one additional member, uh, Finland. That's a very important addition. I had Finnish and Swedish troops under command yeah. in Afghanistan. They're very well equipped, well trained highly professional. Uh, so that's very dramatic. And then the other irony is, of course, that no one has done more for Ukrainian nationalism. No Ukrainian nationalist political figure has done as much for Ukrainian nationalism as has Vladimir Putin. Quick one on NATO. I just People are talking about a new leader for NATO because Jens Stoltenberg, who most people think has been quite good. Do you, is there an obvious candidate from your point of view? Um, I, there, there are some, but I'll, I'll leave that, I thought you that might behind that. the scenes. One, one last thing I should say as well, that the, um, rather annoyingly, as you're now invading my area by writing books, and um, there, you have one coming out again with a friend of mine, Andrew Roberts, Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine. It comes out in October. You should all buy a copy. But... Um, available for pre-order on Amazon. <laughs> one, one very... Exactly. That the general, look, it's appeared. Amazing. <laughs> um, uh, one last question on that from Ukraine. What is the big, le what's the main lesson, one last thing, what, what's the main lesson that we have learned from Ukraine in terms of warfare? Well, the, there are a couple of them, but 
Uh, first of all, I'd point out this is not the future of warfare. Mm -hmm. This is the Cold War turned hot with the addition of drones and smartphones, internet access and social media, gradually seen more long range precision munitions and the rest of that. But I think that's, that's hugely important. The other is though, that the possibility of interstate warfare that goes on for a long period of time and requires a real military industrial base is not over. And this is one of the big lessons for Europeans. I was at the, this year's Munich Security Conference as well, and I think the big takeaway from that conference was that we need to revive our military industrial bases. By the way, the same for the U.S. Uh, we're providing millions of rounds of artillery, uh, and we have to dramatically increase our production. General David Tress, always great to be soldier, with you, John. Now author, heir to Alexander the Great. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you all.